thank you so much, uh, Jen and Robbie, for taking the time um, to meet. Um, I wanted to, you know, to talk to two of you in thinking about, you know, physical therapy delivered via telehealth in light of all of the, uh, you know, the pandemic and the, and, the, and the situation that everybody is in, um, you know, safer at home and that type of thing. But being able to, to continue care both as a physical therapist, but continuing able to uh, receive care as a patient. And, you know, it is a bit different. So both of you, uh, Robbie as the patient and Jen as the PT, um, you know, have this experience and uh, want to use this time to really just talk about, um, you know, your experience, what you learned from it, because, you know, to be quite honest, in a hands-on profession and as a patient, as a PT, it's easy to be skeptical from both ends, you know, for the patient to be skeptical, for the PT to be skeptical, to not really be used to, uh, you know, that world of telehealth within physical therapy. So I have uh, some questions uh, for both of you. Uh, I'll start with, um, with you, Robbie, who, uh, as the patient. So can you describe what it was like being a patient um, without the physical therapist, uh, you know, physically in the room with you? You just kind of describe that experience? Yeah, so, you know, it's it's certainly different. And I, I will say that I was skeptical <laughs> until we did this. And so, you know, what I thought was really cool is that, you know, there was that established report, just like you would do in a clinic. So, you know, introductions, making me comfortable, uh, really, you know, giving me very specific direction on what to do, giving me specific directions on where to put the camera, where to move. And so because uh, Dr. Gimbo is very good at her job and she's very good at directing, then I didn't, you know, once I kind of got over the, oh my gosh, camera and whatnot, you know, it, it didn't feel any different other than, you know, she couldn't touch me or move me and say, do this. And so I feel like, you know, you have to be very, very um, good as a therapist at directing your patients and what you want them to do. And, and I'll piggyback off of that for a, a question for you, uh, Jen, as the physical therapist, mm -hmm. um, how do you have to prepare differently for a telehealth visit, you know, compared to the in-person face-to-face? Like, I guess the what has to happen beforehand and then you know for for you to be effective in your time with the patient you know right. what, what do you have to do differently yes yeah, so i think I, I would talk about what, what's similar first right okay. which is before you are going into your evaluation you know you, you're planning your session right so i needed that medical history ahead of time i really needed to understand what she thought that what Robbie thought her functional deficits were because I'm you know I'm thinking through okay how am I go how am I going to do my my selective tissue testing and how am I going to do you know how am I going to figure out is this joint is this muscle is this you know what is this and um, so for me understanding that history is really really important for prepping and then I go in and I you know I kind of set up the eval um, knowing what I can accomplish and what I can direct a patient through. So uh, I need range of motion, but I need kind of standardized ways to look at and range of motion. So I use the selective functional movement exam because those are very dichotomous uh, measurement points, if you will. And the, the measurement system is very consistent and the inter-rater reliability and intra-rater reliability is pretty high. So I choose that. And then depending on what I'm seeing there, I'm like, okay, well now I'm still going to hone in. I, you know, okay, there's a lot of, there was a lot of neck stiffness. So now I need to figure out, well, I, I can get her to test the soft tissue. Is this neck stiffness because of soft tissue? And, you know, it was a little easier because she knows the lingo, which was lovely. Um, but, you know, we went through and we really palpated sternocleidomastoid, we palpated scalenes, we palpated upper traps, we palpated levator scap. I didn't call them those things, but that's where I put our hands. Um, and then we were really able to say, to, to look at, uh, you know, based on our range of motion testing, I had a hypothesis. So I wanted to test it and I had her do some joint mobility testing and documenting wise, you know, you say this is patient guided, patient guided. So, you know, it, it, it is what it is, but you still, it's amazing what you pick up in terms of the distinction between soft tissue joint stiffness and um so it, it, it yeah you just and 
the biggest issue I think is having to be so precise with mm -hmm. your language. Yeah, I think you bring up just something, an interesting point that, you know, I didn't consider or I'm sure other PTs may uh, not consider in terms of you can still have that palpation exam. It's just being, like you said, precise with that language of touch here. Now right. I need you to, you know, touch there, you know, right, right. <laughs> you know, no, go back a little bit more, but also, you know, being precise in language to make sure they're, they're palpating in the right place. But then also the instruction of, you know, which is no different than the clinic. Well, tell me what you feel, right. uh, you know, or you know, can you describe that? Since you can't feel with your hands, uh, like you said, being just being precise in your instructions, not only for the position, but what you want them to tell you of what, what they may be feeling. That, that that's really right. interesting. That's really neat. That's yeah. <laughs> that, that's great. All right. So uh, back to you, uh, Robbie. So as a uh, patient who went through an evaluation and some follow up visits, uh, you know. I guess, what were you most um, concerned about? Uh, and, and also, like, what were you most surprised about? I guess if you could kind of, you know, touch on both of those aspects. Yeah, so probably my biggest concern, you know, and, and probably some of your patients may have this too, like, where am I going to put this camera? And how's she going to see everything? And is the lighting good? <laughs> you know, so silly things that you'd worry about. This technology, do I have a good connection in this location? So, you know, that's funny that that's what you're concerned about. But I think some of our patients, especially those who might not be as tech savvy, you know, might have similar concerns. Jen did a great job sending me information up front to tell me what to expect, what how to prepare, and that sort of thing. So I think that's really important. And then um, I wasn't really concerned about the session itself, other than, you know, the, the technology side of it. Then as far as uh, what I was surprised about, um, I was very surprised at how much she could do without her hands on me. And, you know, we, we, she gave me good instruction as if I was not a therapist. And, you know, how much we could accomplish, how much I could do myself. And, you know, the, the best news of the day was I'd had a headache for seven days straight, 24 seven, uh, until I got treated and my, I haven't had a headache all week this week. So that's, oh. I mean, that's phenomenal results in a short period of time. And in a really area where, you know, we all value our manual skills and, and I don't want to discount that. I think, you know, that's still super important, but in a time when people can't come to you, you can still make significant gains without the hands-on piece. Um, and I think the other thing that surprised me, I took more responsibility for myself because I knew, you know, I, I wasn't going to get the hands on piece. So I had to do, you know, be consistent with, with the instructions that were I was given. And, and so I think those are, those are kind of key takeaways. Yeah. I, I think, you know, the biggest takeaway I hear from that as well, you know, just personally in, you know, not having any experience in telehealth, either as the therapist or the patient, but in terms of thinking as a therapist of, well, you know, not, I guess the advice of not throwing your hands up in the air and saying, well, as a PT, there's nothing I can do because this is, I have to be face to face, you know, if they have neck pain, you know, or, or even as the patient, well, what are they going to do for me through, through a computer? And just, I think breaking down those barriers is something that um, sounds like, you know, happened uh, with you, which is, which is phenomenal. Uh, my next question is for uh, Jen. Uh, so what do you like uh, best about being able to util utilize telehealth to see your patients? Well, definitely because we can still make a difference. I mean, and that's, <laughs> Robbie and I are still seeing one another, right? We're, because I'm like, no, we can get this better. This is, we don't have to stop here. And so that, I mean, that's, it's fun. It's, it's, it's fun. Um, but you know, I have to say that, that in my clinic, we work really hard in a patient empowerment model. Um, and we're always, uh, you know, it's this mantra of don't steal the patient's power. And so even the amount of hands-on work that you do is we're very judicious with it because we don't want to set up the situation where somebody is dependent or feels like they're dependent on you. And so this actually fits right into our patient empowerment model. And, um, and, you know, and then it's just, it's an intellectual challenge of, you know, just, okay, how am I going to get her to do this? Um, and, you know, what, what do I need her to block so that she, when she moves it, you know, when she does the movement that she's actually mobilizing the joint herself. Um, and I think it just ends up being super creative. 
Uh, but you still have to look at your regional interdependencies. I mean, we were treating her neck and the, you know, where we needed to start was mobilizing her thoracic spine. You know, I can't treat your neck unless your thoracic spine is moving. So that's the same, the, the critical thinking skills and the, um, I mean, that's, you don't lose your head when you're virtual. That it, all, you, if you collect the data and you've got a, a working hypothesis and then you're going to do some tests to try and prove or disprove that hypothesis and then you treat to it. Even if you have to treat to it through using mobility exercises, then stability exercises, and then progressive resistance um, tra training, which is really what we've done is here's the mobility. It's got to happen first. Here's the stability because you just moved it. And now we need to, to make sure that you can, you know, put it into the framework and then we can put some strength training on top of it. And, 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 I, and I think, um, you know, something that comes to mind when you say that in terms of you know, the clinical reasoning, the whole, the whole, um, you know, thought process of being a physical therapist, that, that part doesn't change where the, uh, the, the part does change. is just, you know, you're, you're not able to put your hands on. So now the problem solving comes to, well, how do I get them to do that where I right. can't be there and instruct them in that, but the actual skills, the thought process and everything, none of that changes. Like you said, you, you're still the therapist, you know, you still go through, um, you know, what you would normally do. And, and that's fantastic. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and I think that one of the most important things is Jen's really good at smiling and she's also really good at giving encouragement, just like you would in a clinic, right? So, you know, when I wasn't looking at the computer and I was trying to create or complete a movement, still getting that verbal feedback of, you know, keep doing, that's great, you're doing good, you know, was really important because you're not, you know, radio silence is not good in any, yeah. <laughs> in any place, but <laughs> probably more magnified uh, when you're doing virtual care. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that, yeah, that definitely brings up a good point of in that virtual care to always having that presence, even if it's just your voice where they can't see you, which is, you know, I think easier to accidentally do when you're sitting at a computer versus in a clinic, you know, as PTs, I'm sure we're always, yeah, you know, always talking, always verbalizing, right. but not losing that of knowing, hey, I know I'm sitting at a computer and they can't see me, but, you know, having that presence and that therapeutic presence as the PT, I think, yeah. Uh, being delivered about that. Yeah, that sounds, that's great. Um, next uh, question for you, Robbie, is in terms of, you know, uh, being a patient who's received telehealth service or physical therapy services via telehealth, you know, what advice would you give patients who may be reluctant for this or just advice overall, um, you know, whether it's they're reluctant or, you know, that, that type of thing, or just kind of advice overall you'd give to someone who is like, yeah, I'm not so sure, like, you know, my neck hurts, you know, I still need therapy, but I'm, I'm just going to have to wait till we're allowed to see him in person or, you know, that type of thing. What, yeah, what would I, I would say, what do you have to lose? Um, <laughs> you know, first of all, try it. And I think it's one of those things until you've experienced it, you, you might be skeptical, but once you experience it, especially with a really good therapist, then you're like, oh, this works. And then when you have a follow-up, then you're being held accountable to what you're supposed to be doing. And so I didn't want to see her on the next visit and she go, what have you been doing? You haven't done your stuff. So I think, you know, trying it and being open-minded, but also hearing from others, hey, you know, this can be effective, this works. Um, it is different and that's okay. And during this time when people can't get in the clinic, my biggest fear for our patients, especially our most vulnerable patients, is that they're being more sedentary because they're being told to stay home. They're being told to isolate, which is even worse. So then that's sitting on the couch and not moving and, you know, they're losing mobility and we know how fast that can happen and strength that, you know, if they're waiting, then things are getting worse and then it makes it even more difficult to to make it better later so you know there's a lot that you can do um through this medium to keep your patients moving and and getting better and progressing um so that you know they don't wind up on the other side of this pandemic worse than where they were before right right of uh, just continuing allowing there not to be a gap in that con you know, uh, continuity of care and that type of thing, absolutely. Yeah. And I will say that, you know, I, I feel like, and even those of us who aren't older and more, more vulnerable, those of us who are working at home all the time, mm -hmm. I mean, this was my problem. I was doing 10, 12 hours at the computer all day long uh, because of the crisis and needing to respond to folks. And, you know, then that 
exacerbates issues. And so, you know, I think that's, that's super important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think too, the other part is, and maybe Jen can speak to this is letting patients know that this is available and we can do this. So I, th I think yeah. you know, some patients may not even be aware that it's an option. You know, they, they may have the desire to continue their care and know of, well, I'm having pain. What do I do? And I think just can, as therapists communicating that to the you know, broader community and especially, uh, you know, current and former patients and that type of thing. Yeah. So we definitely, our clinic has done a, a huge campaign via social media to patients, um, but we've also contacted all of our referring sources um, who are, you know, the physicians who are, are now in telehealth too. And it's really hard to do surgery via telehealth. <laughs> and they're like, I got nothing for you. So that it, the response that we got from the physicians who said, we're, we're, we're up and running was extraordinary. And part of it is that they, they do trust us. They do know the level of skill that we have. And so it, it's not, a, it's not a, a far reach for them to say, oh yeah, this is gonna be impactful. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that, that response has been really, really interesting. Um, and then, you know, we, we also teach a lot of virtual classes, a lot of virtual exercise classes for all scales. So, you know, we teach a Tai Chi class, which is very gentle and slow. And then we teach some crazy, you know, crazy exercise classes too. But, but that's a really nice way to touch your patient community or your client community and, and make sure that they're not sitting on the couch and, you know, especially the vulnerable ones, um, we have a special program that we run. Um, it's called our FitRx program. It's essentially um, an a, a exercise um, is medicine program, and it's designed for for people with cardiac issues, with people with diabetes, um, people high blood pressure, some you know medically unstable folks. Um, and we've still been able to. Oops, my phone's ringing. Um, we've still been able to even there reach out virtually and take them in small groups, but bring them through very appropriate exercise for their conditions. And so again, our goal was to make sure it doesn't matter. We're not going to skip a beat. We need to, we just, you know, we just need to keep moving. Yeah. And I, I just see that, I mean, for the profession in, in two ways of there's the educating of the therapist of, hey, you can do this and this is how and, and that type of thing. But then also the therapist educating the general public of, hey, we can do this and this is how, you know, so That's it's, right. it's, 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 it's both of those venues and, 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 you know, in that sense and referring sources as well, too. Yeah. So uh, same question that I, uh, for you, Jen, that I just asked Robbie in terms of um, advice. So what advice would you give other physical therapists who are either reluctant to or maybe um, just haven't experienced, you know, providing services, telehealth, um, you know, f practice physical therapy via telehealth. Like what advice would you give them um, based on, you know, your, the experiences that you've had? Yeah. So again, you, you prep in the same way that you would for any evaluation, but I think practicing, uh, you know, just do it. And if you don't want to do it with a, with a, an actual patient, then get your colleagues on the phone and, you know, do, do your, walk them through an evaluation. And we all have that, problems, right? We all have problems. <laughs> Something's going to show up and really, you know, and, and I think what our clinic did is we set, we set the format for the evaluation. So we preloaded all of the telehealth language that needs to be in there. So I think Robbie was, was somewhat surprised when she got on the phone and I said, Hey, can I see your ID? And here's my ID. Well, the reason I knew that was it was preloaded into my note that said check IDs. Okay. So I didn't forget it. Um, the, the, the conversation that the, the, you know, says, Hey, this is, we're using zoom as a platform and we're doing the best we can. We're following best practices for, for privacy in this, at, during this time. But please note that, you know, this is not a, a, an entirely HIPAA secure, uh, platform. All of those, those, uh, cues are loaded in. And then we loaded in the, the, the most reasonable, um, uh, evaluation template that we could, right? So we knew that we were going to do SFMA. I knew that I was going to do the general exercise testing to get some sense of strength. So the sit to stand, the push up, uh, the two minute march, so I could get a general sense of conditioning. So I preloaded those things in. Um, and then, you know, uh, knowing that I want the patient specific functional scales. Um, so I think all of that, that preparation and really thinking through what, what can I use that is fairly standard, that is going to allow me to get some test retest so that I know if we've made progress and then will give me real information to, 
to um, design an intervention. Uh, but I get, I think, so part of it is the, the didactic piece. You got to think it through ahead of time. And then it's the psychomotor piece, right? You practice it, but practice it with your colleagues before you, you know, if, if you're feeling that uncomfortable and you don't want to try it with patients. Right. And I, I really like the advice in terms of the being very deliberate of the preparation, even with the checklist of, you know, I think those things, you know, I didn't even think about it. You take for granted of if you go to a clinic and, you know, you go to the waiting room, you grab the patient, you know, you, you know, the, the people up front have already done the check of, yes, but that's who that is. They showed their ID, you know, those types of things. But if you send someone a Zoom link, like, okay, is this the right person? You know, right. uh, you know, and, and it can, even having that checklist. And, um, and I think too, you know, you mentioning in terms of, uh, I think just the logistics and the patient having a heads up of this is how it's going to work can really probably ease some of that anxiety. If we're going to use Zoom and this is how it's going to work. And so that way they kind of have that heads up as well, I think can kind of um, ease ease in and allow for that patient rapport to even, perhaps even be stronger because they know that you've thought these things through as well. Right. So, yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah. Um, I'll go back. One last question uh, for you, Robbie, and I'm going to ask you the same question, Jen, so you can think about it as well. But Okay. Throughout this experience of being a telehealth, you know, either patient or therapist, you know, what have you learned? Um, so, you know, we talked about advice and those things, but I just want kind of the overall of, you know, uh, what have you learned, I, I guess, of telehealth um, or physical therapy within telehealth, either as the patient or the therapist? I think what it's verified for me, and I, I've said this, but it's really brought to light in this medium, is that who we are as therapists and what we are as therapists is about what's between our ears. Um, it, it's, you know, it's about what we know, what our training is, what our skill set is, and how we use our thought process and our problem solving process to help us evaluate our patients, come to a conclusion, and then put together a treatment plan that works. And that's no different. And so, yes, you have to do things a little differently physically. Uh, you have to think through a little bit differently. But I would almost say that if you do some of this type of practice, it'll probably make you a better clinician um, because you have to be prepared. You have to think through. You have to think about what, what direction are you giving the patient. Um, I would think the only thing that's difficult is my right to your left. And that's, that's the only challenge that I see that's, that's really uh, a challenge from a, a doing the tele, you know, yeah. the mirrored image thing. But, but I would say that, I, you know, I've been pleasantly surprised. And I will say, you know, I was skeptical. And until we all got thrown into the telehealth, you know, conundrum because of the pandemic, I, I would not have been as passionate that this is a good thing as I am because I've experienced it. So great. And and same thing for you, Jen. You know, what have Yeah, you I would I would answer in the same way that it really is our thinking and, and you know, it's the critical thinking skills and it's it's gathering the right data and still being systematic about how you gather the data. It's the data collection tools are different, but it's still the same systematic process. You're still doing you're trying to do selective tissue testing. You're trying to, you know, to, to understand, is this, you know, is this a ligament? Is this a muscle? Is this a joint? You, you, is this strength issue? I mean, we, we just, you know, took a quick look at, um, can I say this, Robbie? Yes. Quick, yes uh, sure. We just took a quick look at foot and ankle and realized that maybe that, but those issues, despite a, a, a traumatic history, those issues are likely strength, strength related. Um, so, you know, the thinking is, is the same, um, but I think you do have to be um, even clearer in your mind's eye of what you're trying, of your hypothesis testing. Um, but I love, I love empowering patients, right? And so from a patient empowerment model, it's, it's, it's like that on steroids. It's awesome. Um, and I will say that in all, uh, all three of Robbie's um, patient specific functional um, issues, she, she made MCID. So, so we had, this was our third visit was today was our third visit and, and all three of the, of the activities that she identified, she had improved by at least two and some three and four points. Fantastic. So that's, you know, that's awesome. And, and I would say, you know, as people use this platform, you know, I would think that over time, you know, as a profession, we're going to find that um, this will continue to be a good adjunct to yes. what we do in the clinic, 
because of things like access. You know, mm -hmm. I know I should go to therapy, but I haven't um, because, you know, access and time and those sorts of things. So I think that, you know, using this, I don't believe it will replace our in clinic uh, work, but I think it, it, you know, gives us an adjunct, you know, for the future to, to do some of both. And so I, I think it's certainly um, something we should continue to make progress. So our clinic is scheduled for a debrief, I guess, uh, in two weeks. And the question that has been that we have asked all of our clinicians to think about is when we return to new normal, right? Um, whatever that looks like, what are we keeping from this les these lessons and what are we letting go? And I think it'll be really interesting to hear what we're keeping because I think that, that we're, we're going to be keeping some things that prior to this pandemic, we might not have anticipated even starting. Right. And, and that's and a I, great exercise for clinics to evaluate. That's, that's a great, great idea. Yeah, and I, I think it also speaks to, like you said, Rob, you being a very busy professional, even if uh, you, know, you didn't really have the time to go to drive yourself to a clinic, to go through that whole thing and you know, block out however many hours in your day of, but you know, the efficiency even of um, being able to have that access um, you know, whatever the barrier may be, uh, you know, really speaks to that ability to still receive services and improve your quality of life. And, and you know, how, I guess, I'm thinking how terrible it would be if you didn't do that, you know, in the sense that, you know, in that sense of, you know, continuing on with those headaches or that, that type of thing. So great. Okay. Well, I, I don't have any more questions. I thank you both so much for your time. This was thank really you. enlightening for me, for someone who hasn't experienced telehealth on either. You know, I've heard about it, you know, as a therapist and that type of thing, but uh, that was really helpful. Is there um, any last thing that either of you would like to add that you didn't get to share or, um, any, and if not, that's fine. I just want to say thank you for your time. <laughs> well, and I want to thank uh, Robbie because it, she, she has taken one for the team. She's been so open <laughs> and willing to, you know, willing to let me have her move that that uh camera all around or her, her laptop all around and just so thank you because that's um it does feel like it's, it's a vulnerable position for you to be in so i really appreciate your your openness and willingness mm -hmm. i'm glad and i we just hope that people see this whole module uh that's been put together uh and and thanks jen for being a phenomenal therapist to to help you move forward and continue to care for your patients while everybody's having to stay home. So uh, we hope we've given you some tools and, and, and ways to be successful with this.